everybody. So as people have been listening to Nowhere Land, my Chris Chan concept album, uh, people have had a really great, really positive response to it, and I think that's really awesome. And it's great to hear from you guys. Um, and I wanted to take the time to answer a question that someone had. Um, a, a user named Arknay's Corner wrote in and said, Vanishing Mother is a beautiful example of good horror writing, and I hope to get to write something that terrifying one day. How much time did you spend on that track, if you don't mind me asking? So, to answer your question, Arknay, and I hope I'm saying that right, um, to answer your question, believe it or not, I actually didn't spend very much time on Vanishing Mother. Um, it, it, that one happened very quickly. And what's interesting, I'll tell you a little bit about the process for that. Uh, so when I wrote the, started writing the album, uh, I made it a point, I decided that I was going to write uh, each of the songs in sequence. Because what I found, I, I knew that I had a sequence that I needed to follow for this, um, this album. And what I did was, I did a bunch of research on Chris, I watched the um, Chris the the uh, Chris Chan comprehensive history series multiple times, and uh, a lot of other information on him. Um, listen, you know, I, I listened to a lot of things like uh, Rogue Rogue Internet Man did a good job of reading a bunch of things. Uh, it did a bunch of dramatic readings of pieces from the Quickie and everything. So that that helped me uh, read a lot of the pertinent information from the Quickie without having to try to train my eyes on the screen for endless hours with that. So I did a lot of research and I wrote out a kind of a, uh, first a general outline and then a more specific outline of everything I wanted to cover. And the reason that I didn't, uh, the reason I wrote every song in sequence was because I didn't want to end up with anything where I ended up writing myself into a corner. So for example, um, originally, I had wanted to do a song about Chris Chan's encounter with the prostitute that he hired, um, but that ultimately did not, as I, came, as I wrote out the outline, the narrative arc I wanted to follow, that really was a derivation from the main story that I wanted to tell. So I didn't want to, you know, write that song and then not be able to use it. So. What I did was I made that outline, and as the outline kind of came into focus, as it got more specific, it went from vague topics to specific topics. And as that um, as that happened, I um, I started getting a better idea of what was going to be a song and that sort of thing. And so I started writing the actual songs in the order that they appear on the album. And the other reason I wanted to do that is because I've made, I've made enough albums that I know that if I, um, I've made enough albums that I know that I can get stuck on something and like leave it and go do other songs. And what inevitably happens is I get every song written and complete except for these one or two songs that I was stuck on and then those songs just become these dead weights like I, it becomes almost impossible to finish them and in fact to tell you to give you an idea of what that's like uh working on um Nowhere Land actually uh took the place of this other solo album I've been doing that I've been working on since 2018. And I'd like to finish that album at some point. Uh, there's some good stuff on there, I think. But, you know, I'm still, the, those dead, those those songs I'm stuck on, you know, are still, are still weighing me down. Anyway, so I didn't want to have that with the Nowhere Land process. Uh, so I made it a point to write every song in sequence and not not give up on anything until it was done. And that, that interestingly, that, that caused me to get stuck in some surprising places. Um, Come and See took a lot longer than I thought it would, which was interesting. And I think that's part of the reason that took so long is because something I really agonized over was making sure that I was not giving in to the temptation to uh, criticize and condemn 
Chris directly until it became relevant to do so in the narrative when he actually assaults Barb. And so with come and see where, you know, it's, it's kind of questioning, asking these open-ended questions as if to Chris, like, did you never realize, did you never look at the world around you and realize what was going on? That kind of thing. That took a long time. Also, um, that was the first track where I had to, uh, it, that was the first, well, not the first track to use orchestral elements because um, the uh, uh, Childish One and uh, What Child Is This, those two songs, both used orchestral elements, but there's a section in the breakdown of uh, the, the, uh, the bridge section of Come and See where a full symphony uh, takes over, symphony orchestra takes over. So there's strings and woodwinds and horns. And mixing all of that took forever. Like I'd never, uh, mixing all of that on top of rock band instruments and then still mixing the solo in such a way that it cut through the mix. Like that took forever. So things like that, I would get stuck in very surprising places that way. And then I also knew that I wanted, uh, I, I knew that the outline, from the outset, I knew that the outline would be a two-act structure. And uh, originally, I thought about putting out one album and then a, the first album and then the second album, or two albums, I should say, is Act 1 is one album and Act 2 is one album. The reason I didn't want to do that is because I didn't want to put out Act 1 and then take forever to put out Act 2. Um, it, um, it, it needed to all come out at once because it was coming out as a rock opera. It was written as one piece anyway. But also because, you know, I know from experience that when you get an album out, uh, you know, all of the process that goes into it, all the blood, sweat, and tears, as much as, much as I love making albums, there's a downtime that has to follow because it just drains you. You know, so for, you know, for all of the months that I spent every day coming home from work uh, and just hours and hours in the studio writing, record, writing, recording, mixing, editing all night and then listening to the mixes on the way to work every day and coming home and work, you know, doing new mixes and editing everything, getting everything perfect on each song. After all that, I've been giving myself uh, a couple of very well-deserved weeks of just vegging out in front of the TV and playing video games and everything. Uh, and right now I'm right now I need to be writing the music, need to start writing the music for the second or the third, excuse me, the third axis of Empire's album, which I have done, I have started on, but I need to commit to that process and force. And then also uh, my jazz project is working on a Leonard Cohen tribute album and I need to start tracking for that. So those two things have been the big um, uh, you know, have been things that I've been putting off and, and intentionally putting off because I need to, you know, I need some downtime after this epic 20 song album. Anyway, that's getting off topic, but the point being, I didn't want to do anything that would cause me to lose my momentum. And I knew going into it that Bob, uh, Bob Chandler dying would be the end of act one because Chris, Chris's life, as I examined it, basically falls into two very broad segments. The first being, um, the first being his life under the care of Bob Chandler, where he was um, not. He was, you know, Bob had no idea how to deal with an autistic son, but he at least tried to keep him in line. He at least tried to curtail Chris's worst impulses and that kind of thing. And so uh, once Bob died, that's when Chris went from being an oddity to, and a nuisance to being a public menace, to when people you know, actually started getting harmed by his actions. And he went from being silly and ridiculous to being uh, wantonly criminal and that sort of thing. And, and it's also when the, um, the transition from uh, the transition from uh, male nerd to uh, ostensibly transgender um, in goddess entity, however you want to call what he is now, all of that nonsense started happening. And so um, it's, it's uh, two very specific uh, areas there. And so I knew that that was the, that was the arc it was going to follow. Now, 
to understand um, and to, to give you, because uh, you know, being a writer, I like to, to talk shop about the craft of writing as well. And so to give you kind of some perspective on how Vanishing Mother came about, knowing that I knew that Bob Chandler was going to be the the peak of the whole thing, you know, the the top of the the the, uh, the top of the mountain, and then we would start our rapid descent down to the horrors on the other side of the hill uh, in the second half. And so I knew that it was going to culminate in, um, obviously, the, the whole thing ultimately is a downhill rush towards uh, Chris Chan uh, sexually assaulting his elderly mother. I knew, now to understand Vanishing Mother and how that came about, um, from a compositional standpoint, what you have to understand is that um, by the time I got to the to the end of the writing and recording process for the first half of the album, everything I had been writing had been done had been written on the guitar, and um, e even a song like "Echoes Shaped Like You," which is built, which from a a, a, a listening standpoint, an arrangement standpoint, is built around the piano. Um, I had still written everything on guitar, and the first thing I wrote was that huge, devastating, distorted guitar riff that comes in and everything. And so I had been writing everything on guitar. And so for the second half, I felt like that first half, doing everything on the guitar, making it very guitar-oriented that way, gave it a very kind of relatable and predictable rock and roll context. And when in the second half, when everything started going really off the rails for Chris, I wanted to start going from very atypical, uh, taking very atypical approaches to the writing. So I started doing the writing on different instruments. And uh, that's, that's how you come up with stuff like Chrysalis, which is there's no rock instruments and it's entirely the symphony. It's a synthesized symphony, obviously, but it's just the symphony instruments. Or um, you have, uh, or or you have a um, you have a song like "Access Denied," which is built entirely around those oscillating synthesizers that are going all of that stuff. And you have elements of that earlier in the album too. But that's where I wanted to start building from other instruments, so it would start sounding very unusual and and you know disjointed in a positive. Uh, um, engaging way. And so Vanishing Mother was built entirely around the bass, bass guitar. Uh, bass guitar was what I wrote the song on. Bass guitar was the first instrument I recorded, and I built everything else around it. And so in the writing process, I, um, I, had, been, I had been in the outline. As I was going, I would have little ideas and I would make notes about what I wanted. So like for Vanishing Mother, I wanted to, the musical style to be this really kind of sinister like Euro dance beat thing, Euro pop dance beat. And so um, that and I knew early on I had two ideas. One was the, the, the almost spoken refrain of just vanishing, vanishing, Vanishing Mother. And the reason I knew that that would be effective is because it's detached. And something about people that sound det emotionally detached is what I mean. People who sound emotionally disconnected from, um, from the intensity and the severity of what they're talking about are always, to me and I think to a lot of people, going to be very unnerving and very chilling. Uh, that that idea that someone's demanding something significant of you without the emotional uh, without the emotional display that uh, would normally be associated with a topic that severe or a request that severe it's kind of like um, you know the 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 cliche zombie line uh, or, or line that people say that are zombies or cult members or something like that that where they say join us don't be afraid you know that kind of thing, so that that kind of detached um, 
flat vocal tone, you know, um, the, uh, emotionally flat vocal tone. That was the first thing I knew that was going to be important. And the second thing was um, the chorus came to me. And, um, you know, I, I start, ideas just kind of pop into your head. And um, that line, what are you going to do when only the body remains? That came to me. And um, I knew that that was a very, that was going to be a very devastating line. Now, the thing about horror writing, you know, um, Shakespeare infam infamously or famously said that um, brevity is the soul of wit. And he's right, and brevity is also the soul of horror as well, uh, because things, things are fundamentally scary when they are in the shadows, when we can't fully grasp them, when things are only implied. You know, implication is infinitely scarier than, um, uh, implication is infinitely scarier than being fully exposed to something. You know, so for example, a great, uh, great example of that, look at the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie where Freddy is in the shadows the whole time. We see, uh, we see him only reaching out of the shadows and he's at, and, and because of that, it's a scary movie. Look at Friday, the, uh, um, I'm sorry, Nightmare on Elm Street 2 where, um, you have the, the climactic scene where Freddy is in full view of everybody running around killing kids around the swimming pool at a pool party, and it becomes a cartoon immediately, you know, where you just have this little gremlin man running around slashing at people. It's like, grab him! You know, he's not scary now. So that's the thing. When people are reaching, you know, when things, scary things are reaching out of the darkness, you know, there's a great movie that came out not too long ago called The Babadook, where if you haven't seen it, go see it. But the Babadook is, um, I'm not going to go too much into the plot, but this creature, the Babadook, we only see it reaching out of the shadows, reaching out of the darkness, out of the unknown. And at the base of that, the reason that's scary is because, you know, we are all terrified of what's reaching for us out of our own subconscious, out of the darkness of the void that we can't access. And that's terrifying to all of us. And symbolically, anything that's reaching out of the shadows like that is scary. So vagueness is important. And um, the next thing in, ter in terms of that brevity being the basis for something horrific is you notice that the there are very few lyrics in Vanishing Mother. Now, there's the spoken word poetry thing, and I'll explain that in a minute. But the actual song... Uh, the lyrics are very brief, but every I, I wrote every line of that to have a strong impact. So, what's the first line? A child at heart, but a man in the balls. Very unnerving line. Obviously, something that's going anything that links childhood to adult sexuality is going to be very uncomfortable anyway, because that has very ominous and sinister undertones. Then the um, and then also because we're talking, you know, the the theme through all of this has been a person, the, the theme through the whole album has been this person with the mind of a child trying to comprehend human sexuality, which is a very adult concept and requires, um, requires the wisdom and intelligence inherent to a lifetime of experience to really understand and interact with appropriately. So there's that. And then, so a child at heart and the man in the balls, the, un, the only other soul in these rancid walls so uh, we uh, the rancid walls, the house is disgusting, it's falling apart. So we're hitting these very strong beats that up until now have been built up all the way through the song. You know, um, a child at heart and the man in the balls, that's been a theme throughout. Uh, the house being in disrepair, that was in the song Branchland. Uh, the only other soul in these rancid walls... Uh, rots in the bed where your father slept. So we have to we have to describe this in very strong terminology, strong but simple terminology here. A fading bone bag that you have kept. So that's the though you know that's the first verse, and it's written to be just pop pop pop. Every everything in those lines has to be as loaded as possible in as few possible words. And then the chorus that goes. 
What are you going to do when she can't say no? What are you going to do when she can't let go? What are you going to do when she can't take your pain? What are you going to do when only the body remains? That, um, that is, you know, part, part of the reason you're scared by that has nothing to do with me or my writing and everything to do with what we know about Chris. And the reality that at this point, Chris is now being, the, that, that, uh, that chorus implies the reality of Chris's situation, that he has got to choose the moral high ground. That he's got, you know, he has this, uh, he has this very sick and predatory inclination towards his mother who cannot, who, who he admits cannot, uh, is, is, has a failing mind and is not in control of the situation. He has these sick predatory impulses and he now has to, is at a place where he has to either uh, make the better choice or submit to his or submit to his baser instincts. And what's scary is that a decent human being, uh, ideal, which is ideally, you know, or I should say, at least a a functioning human being, will hear will come to that conclusion, will come to that that crossroads, and ideally make the str the the um, more noble uh, choice and take the moral high ground. What's scary is we know that this is this is a point where Chris has to make a, a real significant decision about his life. And there is existential fear because everything in us is willing him to go this way, but we know he can only go this way. So all of those questions are asked rhetorically. And that's where the horrific aspect of it comes in. Now, what I did for that, that uh, last third of the song where it does the spoken poetry element, uh, you know, the, um, you know, she held you always by, by her side closer still when father died and all of that stuff. So, um, from a, a sonic standpoint, you know, I wanted it to be one of the, I wanted to, do, wanted it to be like, you know, the old, uh, Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, uh, horror movie thing, uh, narrations and everything. And so that, you know, hence the, the long echo on the, the vocal and all of that. But you notice the sound around it. I wanted it to have the effect of being like thunder and lightning like you would hear in those movies. Um, but I didn't want it to just be thunder and lightning samples because that would be uh, cliche and kind of cheesy. So what I did was, I lo and this is where I, I love the, the sonic production aspect of it. But I um, I took uh, some of these uh, arpeggiated synthesizers that you have, you know, the things that are meant to do the uh, 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 kind of dance beat things, and I slowed the arpeggiate uh, the the tempo on the arpeggiation way, way, way down, and then pulled the tone wheel all the way down and hit just low hit just the low end of the keyboard and you can get these great you know when you when you when you hit something you you hit something like that you can get just these great washes of sound and so did that uh did some some onboard manipulation of the sound you know some delay uh i think there's a little bit of auto wah in there and that kind of thing and so you start getting these sounds that um oh and you set the arpeggiation sequence to random so it's going to be hitting you've got this cluster of notes that it's just going to hit randomly and and at random intervals and that kind of thing and you just get these great sounds when you do that so that's how that uh that happened and um and so it creates this effect and then thematically uh that last third is where I just wanted to be, I wanted the narrator, this person that's been narrating Chris's story the whole time, to finally just, you know, my my mental image of the story as it's unfolding is like the narrator, this narrator, this, you know, Virgil to Chris's Dante is just standing there off to the side, asking, you know, almost asking these rhetorical questions that Chris is not aware of and cannot answer. And uh, kind of like, um, kind of like the the penultimate sequence in Jesus Christ Superstar, where Jesus is carrying the cross to be crucified, and 
uh, Judas in, in a kind of spirit form is, you know, asking the, is, is doing all the, every time I look at you, I don't understand why you let the things you did get so out of hand. All of those things, that, that aspect of it, that kind of um, rhetorical narrative, those rhetorical narrative questions, that feeling was what I wanted to capture. And so uh, that final sequence there, it's like everything stops, and we're just going to say what this really is. And, uh, you know, the, there's the lyric in, um, in the, second, the second verse of uh, Vanishing Mother where it says, A uh, puzzle of flesh locked out by the mind left you cold in a world unkind. And what we're talking about there is that, you know, autism makes human interaction seem like this puzzle and um, left you cold in a world unkind, you know, that he, you know, this puzzle has locked Chris out from the world, he can't solve it, he has no way to solve it, and basically what's happened is he's decided to cheat at it. And so he's decided to, he's decided to cheat, he's found a way to cheat the puzzle by uh, prevailing on somebody that cannot, that can't stop him. And so that you know that's what's laid out right there in in that spoken word part and you know i say all that that's vanishing mother really is a transitional segue piece into the more horrific moment which is oedipus prime and oedipus prime uh i knew I knew that I did not want to have any lyrics or any vocals of any uh, of any kind uh, or any singing parts, I should say, of any kind during that section. Instead, what I decided I wanted was to, at that point, use clips from the um, to use clips from the actual um, actual videos of Chris and things people had said to him, you know. Uh, just uh, just in kind of in in loops like that, and I came up that I I listened to a lot of stuff and decided to use the clip of uh, Robert, the clip of Blue Spike, and the clip of the fake father from the Father Call, and the writing for that that was that that was really cool because I love writing orchestral stuff like that that's got these this really strong horror element, and I I really think even though like I said all of that was synthesizers, but. I really think that um, orchestral musicians love uh, playing stuff like that because that's when you get to just like have fun with your instrument and get to scrape, you know, scrape the strings and everything and really kind of cut loose. But I like writing stuff like that because you get to use all the stuff you don't normally get to use, you know, instead of, you know, in, instead of like uh, saying, well, whatever you do, don't use repeated flat nine intervals because uh, or, or flatted second degree intervals even because it'll just get grating and annoying. Instead, you get to rely on all of that stuff that you're normally not supposed to touch. And so the stylistic references for that, uh, Clint Mansell and the Cronus Quartet soundtrack for Requiem for a Dream was huge. Um, the um, Mishima, the, the Philip Glass soundtrack to Mishima was a huge influence on that. And then... Um, uh, just all of the Bernard Herman stuff. I love everything he did for Alfred Hitchcock and that kind of thing. So those were those those influences, writing influences on that. And uh, those things are, stuff like that is always so fun to do. And I love, I love doing stuff. You know, I love writing scary sounding, uh, freaky, scary sounding stuff like that. Kind of the way, for the same reason a lot of actors love to play villains because there's so much depth of character there. So... Uh, that's, you know, sorry, that's, that's a longer discussion than I wanted to, you know, than, than I, uh, I'm, I'm sure you probably intended for your question, but to, to answer it, yeah, it's, uh, Vanishing Mother had just happened very quickly, and, um, it, it happened very quickly, and it was very, um, it, it was one that knowing, knowing what I wanted to accomplish with the song and knowing what I wanted to accomplish with all of those songs made the writing process for each one very easy. I never felt like I was, you know, casting about in the dark for a direction on those songs. So, um, I, I think, um, uh, you know, probably the most time-consuming songs, I mean, um, 
Zap to the Extreme took a long time to record just because there's so many parts to it. You know, it's easily the most complicated song on the album. There's like 50 different time signatures and all of that. Um, because it's, it's going for like that early Genesis, Rush 2112 kind of vibe where there's just all these riffs happening one right after the other. And then um, the final sequence, the, the two songs that um, go together at the end, the end of the circus and the dimensional merge, um, that took a while because that was like, um, all, all aspects of that took a while because it's like we've got to close this thing out with a big emotional punch and so knowing that there was a lot of second guessing myself that went into that I had to like you know I was constantly like no what you know is this gonna land is this gonna land the guitar solo in that uh in that song um it took a um it, it was done in one day I, I wrote it and recorded it in one day but it was very um there was a lot of very careful planning that went into that because I try to strike a balance with my guitar solos between composition and improvisation because you want to have the you want to have something written that'll really land and then you want to have something that will um, you want you want to have those moments where you just cut loose and 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 hit it and have fun with it and um, that guitar solo I really spent a lot of time on because I was like, this one, this solo has to pick up everything that was being said in the verses and the chorus on that song and carry it, like has to elevate it to this transcendental level. And so that solo, uh, I put a lot of uh, a lot of effort and a lot of focus into. And um, there were a few solos like that where, you know, it had the, the emotional impact had to be really strong. The the impact on uh, the emotional impact on echoes shaped like you for example that solo had to really punch that way anyway so that's a lot of talking about a lot of songs and a lot of wild whoops i knew she was going to do that at least once um a lot of talk about the writing process but i like i love talking about the craft of the craft of writing and the craft of composition and all of that so Anyway, uh, Arkane, I, ho and I hope that answers your question. I hope I'm saying your screen name right. Any, uh, the rest of you, if you have questions, you know, feel free to send them in. This has been obviously a huge passion project of mine, and I'm really, really pleased and really touched with the way everybody's responded to it in such a positive way. So, um, yeah, uh, any uh, any questions you have, feel free to send them in. And uh, if you haven't checked out Nowhere Land yet, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's available on all the major streaming services. Uh, I recommend listening to it on Apple Music. I think that has the best codec transfer for the audio quality and everything. But that's me being the producer and the uh, producer and also an audiophile. Uh, <laughs> so the rest of you may not hear any of the uh, hear any of that. I don't know. Anyway. Take care.